uh, recording. We are recording. So just briefly, I just quickly introduced Maria Desmondi and she is going to take it away from here. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alexa. And um, I will begin. Please, I have the chat box open. So if you have questions along the way, I'm going to be able to see your questions pop up. But my name is Maria Desmani, and today we're going to talk all about getting published in one specific avenue. So uh, as Alexa, I'm sure, has spoken about, um, her summit, Women in Publishing Summit, has spoken about, there are multiple ways of getting your book into the world. And so I look at it as you're, you know, you're going down the road and you have a couple different paths you can take. I'm going to choose just one of those roads to take you down today. So a little housekeeping questions in the chat. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me at maria at mariadesmondi.com if you want to screenshot this. Um, and I think she's going to be recording the presentation, so I don't know if that helps you out in any way, but I'm happy to connect via email. I'm also, I think that last dot there is because I was going to tell you my most active um, social media platform that I do not have a team member running, it's just myself, is Maria Desmondi Books. And so that's on Instagram, Maria Desmondi Books. So you can always DM me there. But I am in my 40s, and so email's probably better. <laughs> um, so here, here is myself before COVID, and here I am post-COVID with my natural curly hair. I started off, actually, if I go way back, I can tell you I started off as an educator. So I was in the classroom for just over a decade. It was about 11 and a half years with the maternity leave um, that I'd taken. And in that journey of mine, I wrote a book called Spaghetti and a Hot Dog Bun, which was published in 2008. I wrote the book in 2006. And it was published in a hybrid sort of um, fashion. So I did put some money behind the project. Um, and But it, I'm going to say hybrid because they did work with a distributor. And um, so it's kind of self-publishing. I think now we, we would call it uh, hybrid. But so anyways, that was back in 2008. And I really enjoyed the process. I really enjoyed the journey. The book started to sell. I started to do speaking engagements. I was able to make back my investment within nine months tops. So I decided my investment was $13,000 and some change. Um, and so I decided, gosh, I want to do this again. Um, so I published another book with that company. And um, by book three, I decided to go on my own and I started self-publishing. So books three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Books three through ten were self-published. Um, and then somewhere along the line, I was approached by an NFL player, and that NFL player's name is Stephen Tullock. And uh, his publicist saw me on the news and said, gosh, Stephen would love to write a book with someone. He's got a really special story to share. And I heard his story. It was all about perseverance and grit. And I said, let's do this. So him and I wrote a book together called The Little Linebacker. And at that point, my distributor said to me, hey, Maria, this is a little strange. Like, now you're publishing for other people under the company Maria Does Money Inc. Do you think you want to start a publishing company? And I thought, oh, OK, well, maybe. Um, and so I don't even, I didn't even put my publishing company on here, but it's called Cardinal Rule Press. And so that's when I started publishing was 2005, Cardinal Rule Press. And I put mom to three because through my journey of becoming author and publisher, I also became mother to three younger children, um, Dexter, Ruby, and Leah. So that's kind of my, my journey. Uh, hybrid in the past, we would call it Vanity Press. Uh, so that at the time, 2008. It's what they called it, um, Cardinal Rule Press, and that is at cardinalrulepress.com. So Cardinal Rule Press really actually started as a hybrid press with Stephen Tullock. That project was more of a hybrid uh, model, and then I decided to go traditional, and so we've been operating for the last few years as a traditional publishing company. All right, are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? Let's dive into this. So there's all these different types of publishers. And I mean, honestly, if we were to take all the names, like I told you, hybrid was also called Vanity Press and they're self-publishing. Let's look at it as really three models today, three roads or paths that you could take. Self-publishing, meaning you're gonna be the person in charge of paying for everything. You're gonna be the one 
finding the illustrator and coordinating the design work with the artwork, um, doing everything from scratch on your own. The second being, um, oh, see now I don't, I didn't really do this appropriately. So vanity press, meaning like self, uh, Alexa, you might want to help me out here. So vanity in the past was more of along the line of self-publishing. So with Archway, which is very negatively reviewed online, I would not recommend them. They're not truly self-publishing, but they're looking at themselves as a hybrid. Would, can you just talk on that for a second? Yeah, so the biggest difference here is that they, they tout themselves as a publisher, but really they are a self-publishing assist company that also keeps royalties. So they like take all the best parts of what's out there and smush them into one, the best parts for them, not necessarily the best. Plus most of them have very expensive packages, require you to buy thousands of copies of your books and all that kind of stuff. So well, let's yeah. look at the first one is vanity self-publishing forget that I even told you archway but I did want to tell you don't ever work with them because <laughs> I've, I've had some clients work with them and they were not happy uh, me too <laughs> the second being hybrid where you do have a company who says we're gonna help you find the illustrator we're gonna put the design together for you and you're gonna pay a small fee for some of our services but we're gonna do this in a professional way um so that would be hybrid and traditional is the big five and i'll go a little bit deeper into that but in a traditional situation you're not investing any money but you don't have as much control either and you don't have as much input into your project and so that is how cardinal rule press operates we are not part of the big five we are a small but mighty press when when i say the big five it is oopsies there we go and when i say the big five it is Hatchet, HarperCollins, Macmillan, Penguin, Random House, and Simon & Schuster. So these are the companies that people think of when they think of traditional publishing companies, okay? What is going on? Hold on, guys and ladies and gentlemen. I don't know. I don't know why these are out of order. Oh my goodness gracious. We have, uh, let's just take a real quick second here. For some reason, the correct uh, I'm embarrassed here. The correct format did not transfer over. Um, can we just take a real quick second here? If anybody Absolutely. has Absolutely. Yeah. If anybody got questions while, while she's fixing her slides real quick? I'm sorry, guys and gals. Don't worry I'm about it. Here. Do not worry about this at all. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on the difference between like a vanity and a self-publishing assist, if you don't mind, because I think it's an important distinction. Like, um, Write, Publish, Sell is a self-publishing assist company. You pay us, we produce your book, we publish it, but you it's published under your account. You get 100% of your royalties, all that stuff. We just make sure that everything is done properly, so you don't have to worry about learning how to format and learning how to do all those types of things. Then you have um, uh, the companies like Archway and there's there's many 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 of them where you pay them a large amount of money they put their now they put their name on the book but they don't operate uh, like a traditional publisher in the fact that anybody can submit their book and get published by them so there's no editorial review process they don't make sure your book has been edited properly um, their marketing efforts are generally very generic and um, that's part of the reason why people are so unhappy with them because they pay for all this money and then they find out that their book has just been like generically marketed to their email list with with nothing behind it there's there's problems in the editing the book probably shouldn't have been published the way it was but they don't care because they just publish it type of thing that those are usually the stories you hear behind that and then hybrid generally operates as a publisher but because they're working with a lot of smaller um with clients who are first time authors or people who don't know the process and the system as well. Um, it becomes a very expensive publishing as I'm sure Maria will attest to can be a very, very expensive uh, process. I mean, you heard her say she invested $13,000 in her first book okay. and um, you know, there you go. Okay. Okay. I, sorry. I about filled that. the gap. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what happened, but um, I lost slide three, so we're good to go. Sorry, I'm like sweating now. I, I'm not super tech savvy. I apologize for that. So thank you for that, and we can continue. 
Woo! Okay, so we talked about the big five. So really what I wanna go back to is when I start going into one, two, three, four, five, I'm going through 10 steps for you to get you from start to finish, okay? So the first, we're just talking about the types of publishers. And actually my slides are in order, but slide three just didn't show up here. So traditional publishing, just giving you an example. Three would be example of the, the big five. So let's really dig in. So let's say number three is make a decision. Do, if you're gonna go with traditional publishing, I'm gonna now take you through what do you need to do? So this is when you're going to wanna go ahead and write down your questions and um, take notes because now we're really in it. So number four, we're gonna, before you even write that book, ladies and gentlemen, you want to do market research. And this is probably the most important thing. So I wanna tell you a little bit about how, Car how Cardinal Rule Press operates because we operate like a lot of the traditional companies. We have a certain submissions period every single year. And so, and we'll get a little bit deeper into this, but we actually only read manuscripts for, uh, let's see, November, December, and January. So for three months a year, we're reading manuscripts. If you send us your manuscripts outside of that time period, we're not going to read it. And the reason being is we really like dig deep and we take a nice deep dive into what we're looking for. And so that's, we get uber focused for three months a year. And when we're doing that, we are researching books. So let's say you submitted a book and it's called Susie's Swim Poop, Swimming. Susie Swims. I'm pulling this just, you know, I'm making this up. Susie Swims. And it's all about a little girl who learns how to swim, let's say. We're going to take the time, if we like that manuscript, we're going to take the time, we're going to take our resources, we're going to start researching that book. Is there another book on the market that talks about a little kid who is afraid of swimming and learns how to swim? And if there is, why is your book better? Why should we take the risk into to spending all this money, around $20,000, on your idea if there's already two, three, four books on the market that are just like that? So before you write the book, I want you to do your market research. I want you to figure out if there are other books on the market that are similar to it, what makes your book, it, book different? And one of the really cool things to do, let's say with Susie Swims, it's on, um, let's say there's another book that has, you know, Donovan Swims on Amazon. I want you to read the negative reviews on Amazon on a book similar to what you want to write. Okay, and the reason why is what are the readers saying Donovan Swims is lacking? What are they saying that book is missing out on? Why are they saying they don't like that book? If your book can fill the need of what the readers are looking for, then yes, I would say go ahead and write the book. Um, if you're writing a book that's already on the market and is getting all five-star reviews, people don't have complaints about it, it's really similar, I would say don't waste your time writing it because most publishers are not going to take a risk if there's something similar that is doing really well on the market, okay? Um, so does that make sense before I move on? Okay, so market research is really important. And one way you can do this, um, now it's so easily available, I would go on Pinterest and start typing in keywords that go along with the theme of your book. Go on Amazon, go on good Google, get the books out from the library, go check them out and physically hold the books in your hand and say, what is different about what I wanna write compared to this book, okay? Okay, so what are some of the current trends in the market right now? I'm going to share that with you. And I'm gonna share with you how you can be in the know of what the current trends are. Okay, so the first thing you can do is you can subscribe to industry, free industry newsletters. So for example, Publishers Weekly has a few free um, newsletters that they send out via email weekly. And uh, in my case, it's a, a children's book one that you would wanna subscribe to if you're writing a children's book. And it will tell you stories about new books that have come out that are doing really well. And, and just reading that five minute uh, newsletter every week is going to help you to know what's trending. But I will tell you from all of what I've been reading in the year 2020, which is just such a stellar year, positivity is actually trending in children's picture books, okay? So that is something that books are being released about positivity, books that are empowering children. Diverse and realistic as well. Authenticity required. And what I mean is with everything that's happening, 
in the Black Lives Matter movement, books that are about a diverse character, but not written by someone who is of that same ethnicity, they are really, really frowned upon. So if you, for example, we have a book coming out um, in a couple months called Raja's Pet Camel. And it is about a little boy. It's set in India. It's about a little boy in India um, who has a camel as a pet. And it's a realistic fiction book and that's trending right now. But it's also written by a woman who is Indian and who has grown up with that culture in her life. And so you really want to make sure that it's authentic. Um, and this goes, I mean, if you're talking about adult books, like realistic um, historical fiction, you know, there's got to be a lot of research that goes into it. So it's really following a trend of other genres as well. So right now, in this year, the books that are coming out, positivity, they're diverse, and they're realistic. Okay. Not to say that other books aren't amazing, but this is what's currently trending. So the next step would be to write your book. So now that you've done some research and you know that what you, your idea is going to be unique in some way, um, I will tell you the, the last statistic I heard is that there was 42 million books on sale on Amazon. So of course, if you write a book about a little girl, who learns how to swim, there's probably gonna be another book about a little girl who learns how to swim, right? So it is, I don't say be afraid to write books that are similar to others, but really do your research and figuring out what's gonna make your book better and um, more enticing to readers. So now you're gonna write the book and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on writing because, you know, this, this part you can Google, you really can. Um, get the words on the page, Stop telling your grandma and grandpa and your next door neighbor, Joe, and you know the lady at the grocery store that you have a great idea for a book. Get the book on the page, okay? I'm sure Alexa talks to many people who knows what she does for a living and they're like, I've got a book idea. Get the book written, okay? She's shaking her head. I'm still sweating from my little technical error. I'm so sorry, everyone, I have to put my hair back. I don't do well with failure. All right, so next, format the book correctly. So what I mean is when you write the book, maybe put it in Google Docs for now, okay? Because a lot of people are using Google Docs and you can just get the words on the page. But different publishers ask for different formatting. And this is where it gets kind of annoying for you. So for example, we do not accept books that are in Microsoft Word format. And the reason for us is we have many different team members who are reading the manuscripts that come in and it's just so much easier for us to have a Google Doc format to share between a couple of our acquisition editors. Um, so if you look on different publishers' websites, and I'm gonna teach you how to do that in a second here, um, you will wanna see in their submission guidelines what format do they want from, for your book, for your manuscript, okay? And sometimes they'll say, attach it to the email, and sometimes they'll say, cut and paste the actual book within the body of the email. So publishers have different ways that they want the book sent. Excuse me, and you really wanna follow directions there because, and we're not like this, we, we don't put you in the slush pile if you don't format it correctly, but it just makes more time and more work for us. Um, but there are some publishers, maybe in the big five, that they're, you know, we got over 600 submissions last year in our three month time period. I mean, these big five companies are getting thousands and thousands of picture books. So if we're looking at someone who formatted it correctly and someone who didn't, sometimes they're just throwing those in the slush pile and you're not even getting a chance, okay? So before submitting your work, this is the part I will tell you um, that you're probably not gonna find on Google, is I would love for you to work with a critique group. Find a group online or a local group that, you, that will read your manuscript and give you feedback. SCBWI, and I will type that into the chat, SCBWI, is um, an organization and it stands for Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators. And there is a small fee for joining this organization, but I highly recommend it because they have a ton of free training, free advice for people who want to go into the children's publishing industry traditionally especially. Um, and they, you can find a critique group by connecting with individuals in that group. They have local chapters and they are not paying me to tell you this. I just know that 
I have benefited as an author through the group, and that's where you can find a critique group. Otherwise, maybe at the local church that you attend, maybe there's a couple ladies who have written books and they've already started a group, you can you know, connect with people in that way as well. But a critiqued group is gonna give you honest feedback before you actually submit the book. A professional editor is another really great person to reach out to and say, you know what? I think my book looks really good. I've shared it with my husband. I've shared it with my sister. They think, they think it looks like there are no errors in it. I would still recommend you paying some money to have a professional editor look at it and make sure that it's formatted as far as like plot and character development, if they have any feedback there, but also as far as grammatical errors and um, that respect. Um, so that's like copy editing, okay? And I do see that um, Alexa mentioned Meetup would be another place that you can go for looking for writing critique groups. Uh-oh, there we go. Um, use feedback wisely from editors. So these people who are giving you feedback, I love these little notes. Good news, you've got a book in you just waiting to come out. Again, get the book on the page and just keep writing instead of just keep swimming, just keep writing, get it on paper and make sure that you really listen to people's feedback. I know constructive criticism can be really hard, um, but listen to what they say and uh, take it with a grain of salt. Like if you hear the same thing from two people, you probably wanna make the change. All right, so when we are getting ready, now I still haven't told you how to find a publisher, but there's something else to consider is, are you going to look for an agent or not? Because at this point, it's a decision you want to make. So you've gone down the road of traditional publishing, but now you have another fork in the road, agent or no agent. So in working with an agent means that they are going to be, you're using your manuscript, it's going to be called a solicited manuscript. And what that means is someone is soliciting to a company on your behalf. Okay, so an agent at this point would say, gosh, I really like your book. You're going to share your manuscript with them. They're going to say, I'm going to take a chance on you and I'm going to help you to find a publishing company. I'm going to sell your manuscript to a publisher. Now, an agent is going to take a certain percentage of your royalties. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. Now, are there publishers that will look at your book if you're not working with an agent? Absolutely. And what that's called is an unsolicited manuscript. That means when you're going on different websites, when you look on Cardinal Rule, Red, Rule Press website under submission guidelines, it's going to say, we accept unsolicited manuscripts. So that's just fancy lingo that this company that I'm working at, we are going to look at your book even if you don't have an agent, unsolicited manuscripts. Um, agents take a commission. And then I have a couple um, examples of popular children's agencies. So there is Writer's House, and within that agency, there are about 20 different literary agents. And when you go to Writer's House, you'll notice that some agents are looking, to, um, looking for books for young adults. Some agents are looking for you know, adult novels. Some, some are looking for children's picture books. So you want to look for an agent that is specific to the type of book that you are writing, okay? Um, Andrea Brown is another agency that is popular. And I'm gonna tell you, Metamorphosis is a newer agency and I've gotten several submissions from Metamorphosis and they're smaller but mighty, okay? So I use that term with my own company. We are small but mighty. We do not produce a lot of books per year, but we sell those books quite well. Metamorphosis is a smaller agency, but they have definitely sold um, manuscripts to companies and they have made money for their authors. So, and they're not paying me either to do this. I'm not an affiliate for any of them, okay? Um, now, you can go to liter literaryagencies.com um, and from this website, I read that there are 317 book agents in the United States who represent picture book writers. That's a lot of agents. So I feel like the number, I don't know how many submissions they get, but that's a good number for this year. So that's hopeful, okay? Next, 
is the big part. So you've written the book, you've shared it with a critique group, you have had it professionally edited, you've made the decision, hmm, am I going to get it published? Am I not going to get it published? So now we're at step number seven, finding publishers to pitch. Now, at this point, right, if you have an unsolicited manuscript, that's a big, that's a big um, keyword that you're going to want to look for and also to follow guidelines. So honestly, at this point, I'm going to give you a couple resources, but at this point, you're going to put some work in because you have to go to each individual website and you have to look at their guidelines. How do they want you to submit the book? Do they want an email? Do they want the Google Doc attached? Do they want it in the body? And this is the part that I wish I could tell you it was easier. I mean, it would be amazing if there was a portal and you could just put your book into a portal and it goes out to everyone. This is the part that's gonna require a little legwork. But here's the cool part. This, this part of the process, it's not gonna take a lot of brain power, but it's going to take some hours, right? It's gonna take some time. Um, so if you have an unsolicited manuscript, make sure you're looking for that key term in their guidelines. And at this point, I would recommend, and I don't have an example to show you, but I would recommend starting a basic spreadsheet. And on that basic spreadsheet, you're at the top, you're going to have name of publisher, you're going to have website, um, you're going to have maybe a link to their guidelines, you're going to have the date that you sent the email. And then what I would do for yourself is organize it in a, in a way that you have a column that says, what is their response timeline? So for Cardinal Rule Press, we give you six weeks after the close of our submission period. So we say within six weeks after February 1st, we will get back with you about an answer. So with Cardinal Rule Press, if we do not want your manuscript, we are going to send you an email either way. Yes or no, you get an email from us. But that's not the same with some companies. So on this spreadsheet that I'm recommending that you create, get organized and tell yourself, okay, I submitted to Simon & Schuster. How many months does it take? Are they gonna get back with me? Yes or no? And if not, what can I do at that point? Give yourself a column that says, if you haven't heard back in their time frame, what can you do? So each publisher on their guideline page will say, okay, if you haven't heard from us, you can call, you can email, or they might say, don't reach out to us. If you haven't heard from us, give us more time. So just organize it in a way that when you're going to follow up, you can just go to the spreadsheet and you can say, oh, I haven't heard from Cardinal Rule Press. It's been six weeks since February 1st. They say that you can reach out at this email. I'm going to go follow up and do that, okay? All right, I'm just going to take a real quick second to see if there's any questions. How's everyone doing? Hey, Maria, I have a question on that thought. So um, how about blanket submissions? What happens if you blanket submit your book and you get five publishers who want it? Mm, this is good. This is a good problem to have. So at that <laughs> point, I would start to look at their contracts and choose the um, publishing company that you think sounds like they have the best contract. I think another thing that you could do too is, and I've had people do this, you would ask the publisher, can you send me um, the contact of one of your authors so I can get some feedback from them? Like, what is it like to work with uh, Cardinal Rule Press? Would, would one of their authors actually recommend it or would they not? I think that's good because you get the inside scoop and some authors will say to you, no way, I would never do this again. You know, the publisher was not supportive. Um, they made empty promises. So I think getting some inside scoop would be really helpful. Does that answer that question? Yes, okay. definitely. Okay, so that's another thing. And within the contracts, what could be different is your percentages on advances and royalties. And I, I'm pretty sure I have a slide that goes a little bit deeper there. So let me share, and so let me just write this down in case I don't, I'll make sure I touch on why, why one publisher might be better than another when it comes to advances and royalties. So now let's look at resources. Um, and this is where, the search process can get a little bit easier for you. 
I like to have a book in my hands. Like um, I have a Kindle, but I definitely prefer, this is a recent book that I read. I definitely prefer like a real book in my hands because I can highlight. I have a daughter going to middle school. So I've been reading about that. Um, so Children's Writers and Illustrators Market, this is a book, I think it's around $20 you can purchase. And they have updated information every single year on publishers in the United States. So the cool thing about this book is you can have the book in your hand and you can search through and they have their submission guidelines. They have the editor name they have. So let's say you find, you know, a company in there. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a publishing company name. Lee and Lowe is a, a comp publishing company. Let's say Lee and Lowe books is in there and it will say to them, this is our submission period. Um, do we accept unsolicited manuscripts? Yes or no. Um, who do you email? What's the email to submit? How do we accept the formatting? And what are our response times? It gives you everything in this one book. So I loved this. This was a great resource um, to be able to look through and not have to go to a million websites. Um, it was just being able to have it in your hands. There was a website called writersmarket.com. And right now it says that it's under construction because it was bought out by another company. Writersmarket.com basically was this book, Children's and Writers Market 2020, but online. So you could type in, you could say, okay, I have a realistic fiction picture book um, and the characters are humans, not animals. And you could kind of do a filter. And what would happen is it would populate your match with publishers that sound like they may accept your manuscript. So write that down. And um, I mean, I literally just went on this last week and probably two months ago it was available. So maybe it's just getting redesigned, but that's a, a digital tool for you, okay? And I think it's kind of a good idea because it, it helps to quicken the process versus just using Google and searching through different publishing companies what publisher to submit to, okay? So you're gonna do some digital research, um, look, look at books that are similar to yours and who was their publisher. So you can see behind me, I have a bunch of picture books, some of our favorites in our family. And let's say you wrote a book that is a rhyming book and it's about you know uh, ocean animals and you're reading one to your children that's very similar, who's their publisher? Maybe they focus on ocean animals. Do the research that way, okay? That would be one way to choose a, a publisher. And um, this is pretty cool. Let me share this with you. Uh, in books, there is oftentimes acknowledgements, acknowledgement pages. And on the acknowledgement page, oftentimes authors would say, I'd like to acknowledge my agent. Thank you so much, you know, Josie so-and-so for being my agent and for shopping this book for me. So in that case, if you're reading a book that is similar to one that you wanna write and you see that someone had that agent, you could reach out to that same agent. Um, a lot of times people put their agent um, on the copyright page too. There might be a little blurb that just says, you know, this book was aged in by so-and-so. So you can always find an agent that way that is in the same genre of books that you wanna write. Uh, do your market research. If there's a book out there, we talked about it. But you definitely want to figure out if you are a good fit with a publisher. So instead of saying, here's my manuscript, I'm going to send it to every single publisher in that book. I'm going to send it to, to the first 25 publishers I can come up with on Google. Don't do that because you may not be a good fit for some of those publishers and you're just wasting your time. So do a little bit of research and see what kind of books do they publish um, what are they looking for? And oftentimes their guidelines are going to tell you that. Okay. Now is the pitch, the big old pitch. You are going to not only send your manuscript. Now think about this. We're talking picture books today. We're not talking about 70,000 words. We're talking about maybe 600 to a thousand words in a book. Okay. So Here's the deal. The big focus for you finding a publisher is going to be on your cover letter, which is not called a cover letter because that would just be too easy. The publishing industry calls this a query letter, 
And I think that's the next few slides. There it is, query letter. It's a cover letter, okay? So in the query letter, you're pitching. You're saying to the publisher, this is why you want to work with me. And you've got to really do this in the first couple of sentences or else they're not going to read the whole thing, right? So hook the publisher with why your book needs to be in the world. What makes you an amazing author? You have to sell yourself just as much as you sell the book. So this is a really good part in the program where I'm telling you, as a publisher, we are not just shopping books. We are looking for authors to work with as well, okay? We are looking for people who are flexible, people who are dynamic and creative, and people who don't mind being out there in the world selling their book. And one way we know this is if you have a presence on social media, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, okay? Okay, so you're going to track your submissions closely. This is uh, the spreadsheet part. Being a good writer is 3% talent and 97% not being distracted by the internet, right? So I said, get yourself organized, get your book out there. But I want to pause here. When you're looking for all these different publishers, and um, Alexa brought up the point, what if you had a deal, an offer from several publishers? What's going to point one out from the rest? Well, there's two things in here. When you do sign with a traditional publishing company, they offer something called an advance. An advance is going to give you some money up front. And so basically we're saying, here's $2,000. We know you're gonna to have to edit your book again once we sign that contract. We know that we're gonna need some of your feedback as far as like, we're gonna need your author bio. We're gonna want you to do some marketing. Here's some money for the time and effort you're putting in, okay? Then once your book gets on the market, so for example, Raja's Pet Camel, October 1st, it's going to start selling. So the first $2,000 of your royalties is going to pay back the advance. So the advance is kind of like upfront money saying, okay, your book's not for sale yet, but we want to give you some money for your time. But once the book hits the market, you're going to pay back the advance before you start making profit. Okay. So I said $2,000 because that's what we pay our authors um, right now as a $2,000 advance. If you're a celebrity, I've seen deals for $500,000 advances. Mm -hmm. So you may be getting an offer from two publishers and you might say, what's going to set one apart from a rest? I've gotten references from both authors like working with both companies. Oh, wait, this company gives an $8,000 advance. This one gives five. That's one thing to consider. The next thing to consider is your royalties. So a royalty is the percentage that you're going to make off the sale of the book. So when a book sells, there's a couple of different things that happen. A certain percentage is going to go to the retailer. A certain percentage in a traditional company situation is going to go to the distributor, okay? So the distributor is the person that stores the books and ships them out. The distributor also helps do sales, okay? Then there's going to need to be another percentage that goes to the publishing company. And then the publishing company takes a cut and gives it to the author. So on average, royalties are about 10 to 12% of the retail value of the book. Okay. 10 to 12%. I've seen it go as high as 15. I've never seen anything higher than that. So if the book is $10 and you're getting, you know, 12% off of the retail value, you're getting a small percentage of the cut of the book. That's where people say, hmm, if I were to self-publish, I would get 100%, right? Or if I were to self-publish, I would get a higher percentage than 10 or 12%. So that's kind of where people start to make the factor, of, hmm, do I want to put in the work? Do when I want to put in the investment? Because the return is going to be a lot higher doing it on my own than if I were to do it traditionally, okay? I've also heard the argument, yeah, but traditional companies, they're gonna do marketing and publicity for you. Well, here I am to tell you, we're gonna do some, but we're not doing it forever. So we have budgets. We have marketing and publicity budgets for our books, and when that budget runs out, we don't put a ton of effort into your book. So right now, um, our company has a, a budget to what we're calling re-engage some of our titles from last year. So after a year of your book being on the market, we're putting some money to re-engage it.
but your marketing publicity doesn't last the life of the book, okay? Um, and the other thing that people say, oh, well, going with a traditional company. So this is 15 years ago. The stigma of self-publishing was so negative. People would say, oh, you self-published. Well, your book, that means your book is not good enough. That is gone. That has gone far, far away. I mean, um, 52 Shades of Grey, is that what it was called? 50 Shades of Grey? 50 Shades of Grey. That was a self-published book. Look at that uh, person who wrote that title. I'm sure they're making really good money after that. So now we've just seen a big shift in the industry and self-published titles do not immediately equate to you're not good enough, your book's not good enough. It has completely shifted. And so now we're seeing some really great self-published titles. So there's a little um, pro and con for you on both sides of the industry. I love my rejection slips. They show me I try Sylvia Platt. Oh, that came out of that came out of sequence. Here we go. I want to talk to you real quickly about we're going to go back to the query letter, but I want to talk to you real quickly about submitting books and getting no's. Okay, so Sylvia Plath is like, hey, whatever. I'm going to save those uh, no's because they show me that I try. There are people who have tried over and over and over again to get published and they've had to wait and wait and they've had to hear no so many times. Okay, so let's take a look here. Jack Canfield had 144 rejections for Chicken Soup for the Soul. Kate, and I'm always, I don't know how to say her last name appropriately, D. Camillo, I'm gonna say, rejected 473 times, and she now has over 20 million, 20, or 20 books that have sold millions of copies each, okay? Amazing. The Tale of Peter Rabbit was self-published. This is another example of a book that was self-published and that has gone so far and has spun off into movies and I'm sure royalties on that aspect as well. Still Alice is a book that I really enjoyed and then The Help, um, those were both rejected over 50 times and went on to be published and adapted into movies. So I want you to know that as you start to pitch, no does not mean no forever. So just take those no's, listen to what feedback you get. Some of the people, some of the publishers, they're gonna give you a, a little feedback. They might say, hey, listen, we really enjoyed your book. It's not a fit for us, but can we give you some feedback? Listen to that feedback. Now let's go real quick back into that cover letter that's called a query letter, okay? There's a format to follow. So you're gonna to wanna to screenshot this one because this is standard format. The query letter, is your cover letter. So when you're submitting to a company, typically the query letter is either going to be attached or it's going to be a part of the actual email. And you wanna personalize the letter. And what I mean is you don't wanna say, dear ma'am, dear sir, or dear editor. You wanna know who, what is the name of the acquisitions editor at that company. And if you can't find it, then you can use to whom it may concern, but typically you can find the name of an editor and that book will give it to you. The book I told you, um, they usually tell you who the acquisitions editor is on staff. Numbers, tell the title, tell us the title of your book, tell us the genre and we wanna know the word count of your book, okay? So that's something that you get out right away. Um, introduce your book with a hook, so that's the pitch. So the acquisitions editor keeps on reading. So within the first few lines, dear so-and-so, I am submitting Susie Swims. It's a children's realistic picture book and the word count is 580 words. And then you're gonna give me two sentences on the book. The book is about blah, 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 blah. And you're gonna make it nice and snazzy so that I wanna keep on reading. Next comes the synopsis the who, what, and why of your book. So give me a little bit more detail about the book. Tell me about you. That's the fifth step. What is your biography? Tell me about yourself. And I wanna know if you've got a platform. I wanna know if you're on social media. I wanna know if you have a blog or a website. And I'm gonna be honest, that gets me really, really intrigued. Acquisitions editors are looking for authors who are already out, even if you don't have a book published, we wanna know that you're creating an audience and that you're engaging with people online. And last but not least is a closing. Thank you so much for you know, consideration. I look forward to hearing from you, Maria Desmani. okay? So 
one, two, three, four, five, six, six parts of a query letter. So, uh, ah, ah, Maria, ah, here we go. Uh, number nine, this is sad. I'm gonna share this, hang on, where do I hit the play? Okay. Um, okay, so number nine, this should say number nine, it says start building your platform now. So that to me is very important to start building your platform right away. And what I mean is you can have a website, um, maybe you don't have a website, maybe you just have a blog. And what do you write? Maybe you're reviewing other children's picture books and you're reading books, picture books, and you're just reviewing them. That is perfect. That is starting a platform, okay? Um, a professional email account is pretty cool. So when I get emails from people and it's like, Joe likes to bike, right? Or, you know, <laughs> Joe the biker, I'm like, okay. Or maybe it says like Alexa the writer. Okay, well, this is her professional email. Um, so investing in a professional email is not gonna cost you any money at all, right? Um, so I want you to here start building a platform now. And then number 10, which I don't know why number 10 didn't get on here. I've got something wonky going on with my slides. It's on this computer, but it's not on my desktop. Number 10 is to follow up. So you've done the work, you've submitted your book, you start building your platform, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. Go back to that spreadsheet, my friends, and I want you to follow up. Do not be afraid to say, hey, it's been six months. You said that if I hadn't heard anything, I could reach out. I'm reaching out. My manuscript is titled Susie Swims, and I submitted the email on, you know, October 1st, 2020. Please let me know what you're thinking. So have those details and then follow up. And again, I'm apologizing. I don't know why the slide is wonky from transferring it from one computer to the next. All right, so that is my program. I wanted to leave some room. I've got about 10 minutes for question and answer. Again, you can connect with me on Instagram or you can email me directly, ladies and gentlemen, from number one all the way to number 10. Um, I just want to say that was fantastic. You always bring great information, very detailed, very um you can see it's a teacher in you. So that was great. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Do you want me to do read I... them to you or do you want to pull them up? Yeah, yourself? let's do it. Let's okay. do it. That's so awesome. the first one comes from Nina. This is an interesting question um, addressing people who have previously self-published themselves and then are trying for a traditional publisher. Do you have any advice on that? Great. Yep. I think that shows that you are out there. Like, tell us about, tell us about in the, um, the query letter, tell us about the book that you've already published. Um, if it's got good sales record, tell us about your sales record. Hey, I self-published a book in 2019. It sold 300 copies and you know, here's my website. You can check it out. So I think that's great. It doesn't hold you back at all. It doesn't, it doesn't look negative. Um, I think a lot of publishers are just, again, we're looking not just for the book, but we're looking for the person. And Personally, I self-published because I wanted to get my message out into the world. And that shows a lot of bravery, courage, and character. So I don't think that should hold you back at all. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> Leslie, you might have to, um, yeah, we might have to, would you be uncomfortable with me pulling you in so you can speak? speak to this because this is uh she's probably going to need some follow-up she says she's working with a publishing company and have written a children's book with an activity book and it's completed with edits illustrations and a cover page and this is where it, where we might need a little more information she only has a sample copy she signed a contract with a company and they also have a printing company but she wants to know what the next steps are because she signed a contract and she and you're stuck if i'm remembering correctly did your did the company go under? Like, I can't remember why you're stuck. Do you mind if I, um, if I, if I let you speak? Are you still here? That was Leslie, right? Okay. All right. Leslie, are you still with us? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. How are you? Hi, Leslie. So, um, Actually, I'm a nurse and I actually was working with a um, publishing company and what they did was they had, she has her own publishing company. So all of the books are um, a bunch of nurses that wrote books 
based on their um, different specialties. Um, had some personal issues, not directly related to the push publishing company, but there were some personal legal issues that were going on with her. So everything kind of got halted. Some of the people got their books published, but I was kind of like in the group with the, um, the last group of people. So I have a book and I'm sitting and I don't have it printed. I don't have it published. And just going through your um, presentation, I think I'm kind of stuck between seven and nine, step seven and nine. Okay. Okay, so is the book illustrated? Yes, the book okay. is complete. It's illustrated. Um, they sent me a, like I said, I have a sample copy of the actual book and the activity book. So I think a couple things need to happen. Um, I would tr look at the contract. Um, I would ask, depending on the relationship with the publisher, because it sounds like it was kind of her fault that everything halted, I would ask her to create like an amendment to the contract or something that says like, I release Leslie McRae to publish the book. Um, you're going to need some type of a release. And that's where I'm not like a uh, attorney. I don't know what the language would be, but you definitely want to make sure that she, like the contract is null and void. And then you're going to want, depending if there's an ISBN on the book yet, you'll probably need to purchase a new ISBN because if it's under her company name, you don't want that. So yeah, um, it, is. Just, it is. Mm -hmm. um, so Alexa, can you type in like Boker identifiers for her to Google that? So there's like a national uh, website that you go to. Um, I think one ISBN is $150 and then you have to get the barcode, which is $25. So you'll want to purchase that and make sure that it's in your name. And then um, you'll probably, legally, you'll probably want to start like an LLC or something to have like a publishing name. And that part, maybe Alexa can speak a little bit more to that. Like if you're going to get a book out into the world and people are going to start buying it, you probably want to have like a company name. What do you think, Alexa? Um, yeah, you can do an imprint without having to do an LLC um, at the beginning. Sometimes people do that just to start. You can create an imprint right on Bowker. They'll allow you to do that. Oh, good. Okay. Um, good. Because for most people, writing a book is fairly low risk. Um, so, you know, the real thing of having the LLC is to protect your personal assets if somebody comes after you. But I would say that as you start gaining traction and great gaining, it's never a bad idea to have an LLC just to always have that protection in place. What if somebody sues you and says that you stole their idea or, you know, um, anything like that. And usually, I don't know where you're at, Leslie, but for here, for me here in South Carolina, it only cost $125 to file for an LLC. So it's not a huge expense for the peace okay. of mind that comes along with it um, but if you need help with the self-publishing assist side holler and we can we can go into detail on that too okay so yeah, my question so you're you are so close yeah with the book because you know I have a printed um, copy of the book within the book with my ISBN and everything it has her printing company on it Yep, so you'll want the digital file. She okay. should be able to release the digital file to you, and then you can just, you know, if you have a graphic designer friend or you can figure it out, you just need to remove that and swap out the ISBN with, you know, your ISBN. And then you just have to make some decisions at that point. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's someone in the self-publishing industry that could coach you along, but at the next point, it's a matter of, okay, do I want to work with Amazon for self-publishing? Do I want to print 200 copies and have them at my house? Or do I want to have them at Amazon? Or, you know, you're just figuring out, like, how are you going to actually sell the book? Right. Um, and I know there's a lot of great coaches out there that could- I do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. I mean, Alexa, you do a lot. So I was like, I don't know. If she's doing that right I know. Now. What do you do? What do you do anymore? But I also Alexa can help you at that next point on what what do you want to do next. Okay. But you're well, so close. You. Don't give up. Yeah. I'm not. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Yasmin asked if you recommend any um, self publishing hybrid companies. I, I went ahead and, and self-recommended Purple Butterfly Press there. But <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and you know, I think the best thing with that is to really be Googling people out there yeah. are honest about their feedback. And um, like I said, Archway, I have had so many people, I used to do consulting kind of like Alexa's talking about, and I have so many people with their sob stories. Like I gave them all this money and they didn't do what they said they were going to do. So just definitely before you're handing your money over to anyone, get some feedback and do some Googling um, to see what people think. Nina wants to know, um, have you ever worked with or do you recommend Book Baby? Um, yes, I actually, when I was self publishing, I used Book Baby to do my ebooks oh, and I, I had a good that. experience with them. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. They're also a sponsor of the Women in Publishing Summit, and I, I really like oh, their CEO. He's a, he's a really good guy. Oh, good. Um, there, there are lots of, there are lots of really good quality self-publishing assist companies out there though. So, I mean, if you, if you look out there and, and, and at a variety of prices and at a variety of things, the, the red flags to look out for is if you think you're self-publishing and then they want to take royalties or they want to put their name on your book or anything like that, that's what you want to look out for. But all right, Leslie, I'm going to remove you as a panelist here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think a big part of it is really also digging deep, ladies and gentlemen, and saying to yourself, why? What's my why? Why do I want to get this book into the world? Is it a hobby? Do I want to write a book, um, you know, about my family's history and I just want to print 100 copies and give them out at the next family reunion? Mm -hmm. Disco discover what your why is. I know when I first went into this, I was an educator and I was seeing some of my kids in the classroom and they were, you know, embarrassed to wear their traditional Indian clothing to school and they were embarrassed of the foods they were eating at lunch. And I thought, these kids have to be able to celebrate who they are. Like, it's so great that they're coming from these culturally diverse families. And I felt really sad that they couldn't be proud of who they were and be proud of their family heritage. And I, I wanted to start creating books that taught children that you get to do, you do you, be proud of who you are. And so for me, my why was to leave a legacy in the world through books. And so, um, you know, discover your why, because that will also help you to discover which path of publishing you want to go. Honestly, if you're writing about your family's history and you want to pass out a hundred copies at your family reunion, then you definitely want to self-publish because that's, that's an easy answer. So um, discover your why, take some time to really sit in, in quiet and figure that out. Can I just say how great your bookshelf looks behind you with all those pretty color coordinated. <laughs> my um, my eight year old helped me do that. And she was like, mama, let's put them in let's put them in uh rainbow order. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is going to take forever. But I mean, I love it. It's very pretty. Quarantine. So. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been really great and inf uh, useful information. Everybody will get a copy of this replay. So don't worry if you didn't get the screenshot or didn't get, you know, some information written down, we'll make sure you have everything. Maria told you where to follow her and how to contact her. So um, thank you so much. This was really, really wonderful information. I appreciate you as always. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. And feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Linda and Nina and Leslie. Thanks everyone.